Greetings, greenhouse people, and welcome to another installment of Tech on Demand, where our goal is always to bring you tips, tricks, and information to produce your best crops ever. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and it is my privilege to be joined by Dr. Will Healy and Dr. Nathan Jonke, two Tech on Demand experts in ball, who are here to share best practices, research, and experiences related to a very critical topic especially for rooting stations and greenhouses rooting large numbers. Today, the topic at hand is best management practices for rooting stations, a hierarchical process to enhance rooting uniformity. And to be honest, this sounds quite daunting. Will and Nathan, first off, welcome. And is this task as challenging as it sounds to me? Uh, it may sound challenging, Bill, but we've got a presentation set up that really breaks this down into five key factors that are going to help um, anybody learn about how to be a successful vegetative propagator. So uh, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Nathan Jockey. I'm the Cultural Research Manager here at Ball Horticultural in West Chicago, Illinois. I'm joined with uh, retiree from Ball, Will Healy, Dr. Will Healy, who uh, really mentored me in my position and has had 30 years of experience in the industry, especially on this topic. And, you know, Ball is not a stranger to vegetative production. We've been doing this for a number of years and produce over a billion cuttings that we ship around the world. So um, we are set up well to educate everyone on this topic. Now, um, we're going to get started here with sharing our presentation and get into this. Sounds good. You know, I think that actually sets the stage with uh, the huge number of, of cuttings that, that Ball's involved in and the experience that mm -hmm. uh, both of you have, both uh, in terms of research and really in uh, hand, hands and, and feet on the ground in greenhouses. And I'm really looking forward to to hearing you, I think you're both positioned really well to cover this. Um, so yeah, why don't you take uh, the viewers and listeners down the path of rooting uniformity? And you know, I'm sure this relates to all sorts of considerations like starting uh, properly and then optimizing all the different factors of plant growth. So it's really enough out of me. Why don't you guys take it away? Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so let's uh, get started right with this picture we have um, on the left hand of your screen here. Now, the top three rows of cuttings here is what we started with when Will first started his career. We're just getting into vegetative production, producing cuttings, shipping cuttings, and we've got this random variability that is actually really frustrating for our customers, right? They can't get all 100 cuttings out of their bags rooted then they're not producing, uh, we're losing money, they're losing money. And so really what we've gotten to now is, and what we always hope for is a uniform, uh, well-oiled machine and producing the bottom three rows of cuttings is that every cutting is rooting every time in a reasonable time, right? Um, so we're again gonna go through these five plant growth factors and how they limit you in your success of rooting and really going to break it down and what's important to key into in that rooting process and will is going to take it away here yep um you know when we start talking about the whole rooting process it's been an interesting journey over the over the last several years as we really start looking at it you look at a lot of the research that's been done and of course, it's always been the research is done on a very small number of cuttings and, and then measuring success on this small numbers. What we're really concerned about is what are the factors that drive uniform rooting, rapid rooting of very large populations? You know, it's not uncommon in a large rooting station to root a million cuttings in one week. Um, and of course, those all have to be done within their specified crop time because they need to be shipped out on time all the time and they have met the quality specifications that we've established. So what we've really done is we've tried to break it down into these five factors to help simplify where are the problems, what should we be focused on, 
and how do we solve the problems that are there. So hopefully, as we go through this um, process, you'll begin to understand where where's the failure, where's the problem that you need to solve, because there's not a lot of time to do this in that very short 10 to 12 week season that we call the rooting season for the rooting stations. So let's start out with what we have found to be the number one reason why cuttings fail. When we talk about hydration, these are cuttings that are fully hydrated. Just like you, you know, Bill is a runner and Bill runs massively fast. I've, I've heard of how fast he can run when he's fully hydrated, but as he starts losing hydration, he slows down. Same with cuttings. As they start losing hydration, they basically also very much slow down. Um, the next factor that there's been a lot of research because it's easy research to do, the hydration research is very complicated to do, but very easy to implement the rules. But light, light intensity, they've looked at light intensity as the daily light interval. A lot of research has been done um, around the world on this particular topic, and it's, we'll talk, explore that. When we talk about temperature, we're really talking about degree day. Degree days is really a measurement of increases of temperature above a base temperature at which the plant just doesn't grow because it's just too cold for it to grow. So when we look at how many degree days, how many hours above this temperature is really important to understand because that really drives respiration and also rate of plant development. So when we wanna be on time with 100% rooted, we really need to understand what are the degree days? How, how does that impact our plant performance and uniformity? One of the big challenges we have is, is the nutrition, and we're gonna talk a little bit about base nutrition levels of that unrooted cutting and how to correct it because unfortunately there's no way that you can get a liner, the rooted cutting, um, rooted within good health and good nutrition without understanding that those cuttings, unrooted cuttings coming in do have a different um, level of nutrition and you have to correct that. We're going to touch a little bit on gas exchange, but you know it sounds complicated, Bill, but when you really break it down into a image, really when you go from A to B, which is basically taking a unrooted cutting and turn it into a rooted cutting, um, basically if we take the top three factors of course, in the middle, you see water where early on we want it to be very wet because we need to keep it hydrated. We need to get it hydrated. And then as you progress towards a rooted cutting, it needs to have less moisture. Conversely, the light intensity. Early on, we want lower light intensity because high light is high temperature. High temperature basically impacts the amount of moisture in the cutting. And so then as time goes on, we want to have more light. And once we get roots established, we want to get lots of light to get a lot of energy. And Nathan's really going to talk about that. We're also going to talk a little bit about temperature and the impact of temperatures, both all the way through the supply chain. The supply chain is everything from the time the cutting has been harvested until you basically have got a rooted cutting. So looking at what is is the temperature during this because temperature think of it as the modulator or, or controller of all the different factors that go into the plant growth because as the temperature goes up water loss increases so that it, it might be good it might be bad depending upon if you're at a or if you're at b at A, you don't want to lose a lot of water. At B, you want to move water through that plant very rapidly. So we need to be looking at how temperature impacts it. So let's talk about water um, because hydration is really critical, the total moisture control of those plants. And we don't start with the time when the cuttings show up at your greenhouse. Um, I think, Nathan, you've been down to visit um, stock plant operations, and these are huge operations around the world where basically there's a lot of variability. The stock plant hydration variability is probably our biggest factor that we've spent the last 30 years trying to minimize the variability. But the reality of this world is it is variable and there's no way around it. So let's just briefly touch on these. Not that it um, is something that you as a rooting station can fix, but as, as it's something that you need to be aware of and why it's so important that we do deal with the hydration once they've arrived. One of the issues that we deal with is the media water holding capacity because we want a soil that doesn't hold too much water, but it does hold enough water so that the plants don't wilt. 
The next thing that we look at very carefully is we've changed the soil that these plants are grown in so that we can water and we can control the hydration of these cuttings because we need to have them at the correct hydration level, the correct turgidity, so that the cuttings will ship efficiently, that grow, grow rapidly, we can get a lot of nutrition into them. So we basically use either a volcanic scoria or a peat-based mix and then add different additives so we can really very accurately control the watering of the plant. The container dimension is really important because we need to make sure that there's uniformity from plant to plant. So a lot of the modern production is actually in a, um, if you think of like a window box or a, basically a box where they can have shared water across the different plants. So you don't end up with wet and dry plants which are inherent in the process, but you have much more uniformity. So the container dimensions is, are important. One of the, the sleepers is, of course, this irrigation system. Basically, um, initially, we all started with non-compensating. So some drippers dripped a lot and some drippers didn't drip at all. If you've ever put in a drip system, you know that it's a kind of a free-for-all um, in that drip system. So you basically go to a compensated, meaning that every dripper drips the same amount. And that basically that ensures uniformity of application. But then you also have to look at how much do you need to water? What is the duration of the on? cycle and how often do you um, put that on because the combination of the duration and frequency gives you how much water is actually added to that container. One of the other factors is the stock maturity. As the, as the stock gets older, basically it has a very different water usage um, profile than when it's very young. And of course, we're continuously harvesting the, the cuttings and taking off the shoots so that the water management within that stock plant is very much different. Root development is also very critical because if you have a disease come through, it basically takes out the root system so they don't take up water as efficiently. And so therefore you end up with plants that are tended to be less turgid, less, um, they tend to wilt more and you have more problems. So you have to be really cognizant of what is the root development. And of course, all of you who've um, looked at roots and shoots know that there's a continuous balance between the root and shoot ratio. So it's important that we don't take too many cuttings or else we um, deplete the root system and that we basically have got enough roots to balance the shoots. So we also have to look at irrigation and media salinity. This is one of those little... Um, issues that you don't deal with when you're finishing plants, but in stock plant management, they'll tend to run a little bit higher salinity levels to give the plants a little bit of a stress to them continuously. <clears throat> and what that does is it gives them better tone. And tone is very important when you go to ship them because cuttings that are too soft basically rot in the bag. And what we called it is supa de china, which is basically Spanish for soup and soup soup of impatience where you literally pour the cuttings out of the bag because they just basically broke down. So you provide a little bit of more sal um, salt levels, a little higher salt, just to give it a little bit of um, turgidity. So those are some of the stock plant um, issues that are there that you have to be aware of that and why it's so important that once you receive the cuttings, you try to compensate for some of those, which is fairly easy. We're going to talk about time of harvest later on with um, Nathan when he talks about um, light and carbohydrates, but time of harvest is very important. One of the phenomenals is that, that you have to be aware of is, is that during the dark period, the night, the cuttings basically, the plants all rehydrate. So they're fully hydrated overnight so that first thing in the morning, those cuttings are filled with water. And basically, if you take a look at the picture in the right-hand corner, this is gutation, where basically the stomates close late in the day. And because the stomates are closed, they can't lose water. So therefore, some plants that are just basically continuously take up water, impatience being the, the poster child of this, basically they've got what are called hydrothodes or little pipes on the ends of the leaves, which basically leak water when there's too much water moving through the plants. And that's called the gutation. And so first thing in the morning, you go out and look at the impatience and they're wet. Why are they wet? Because they've been they sucked up all the water overnight and they're fully hydrated and they're fully turgid. Well, those are bad cuttings to harvest until they dried off because that's just water in the bag and then that gives you um, tissue breakdown. So sometimes we water, um, we harvest very early in the morning because they're fully hydrated, but sometimes we wait until they um, we've 
lost a little bit of moisture because it's ideal. But the reality is, is that as you go from 6 a.m. in the morning when the sun comes up, when they start harvesting until noon, the temperatures are going up and the plants are losing water. So it's a very diurnal over the course of the day. The plants are very wet in the coming in the morning and they slowly dry down. So cuttings harvested later in the day tend to have a different hydration level different level of dry, drying than they are at the very beginning. So there is this a little bit of variability that we um, can. Remember that the photosynthesis rate and carbohydrate load is directly related to the moisture content. If you don't have water, you're not going to get good solid carbohydrates um, production and photosynthesis because it is dependent on water. One of the interesting things that we've seen over the years is that how many hours since the last irrigation, if you harvest too soon after the irrigation, the cuttings are too soft, they basically they've got too much water in them. And then if you wait too long, they don't have any water in them, so that the, then you run into problems. So we have to be very careful about um, in the stock, also looking at the temperature, because as we will talk about continuously through this presentation, as the temperature goes up, basically the vapor pressure deficit, basically what happens is the amount of water that is easily removed as temperature goes up, the warm water holds more water. So it basically sucks water out of the cutting and you basically start drying the cuttings out. So when it gets really warm in the middle of the day and the plants haven't been watered recently, as you can see, there's a little bit of difference in turgidity. So what is the overall production vapor pressure deficit? Some cuttings, um, for example, geraniums are best pr um, produced under low relative humidity and cool temperatures, whereas impatients are produced under much higher um, relative humidity for mo most production. So we really are worried about what is the production vapor pressure deficit, which is the measurement of moisture being moved from inside the plant to out into the air around it. So we also look at the harvest cycle, um, when we're harvesting as far as maturity of that cutting, because that comes into play. Because the one thing that we know is cuttings are like frogs. If you're at all familiar with frogs, is you realize that frogs cannot regulate their moisture content. You can basically take a frog and put them on a um, dry concrete, and basically you can dehydrate the frog in situ as it sits there just by sucking the moisture out of them. The same is true with cuttings. If you take a cutting and just put it under a very, very dry environment, I think we've all seen this, we end up with what we are sometimes affectionately referred to as the dead bird. It just basically is a limp and it just doesn't um, have any hydration because remember the hydration, the water in the plant keeps it turgid. So let's talk about the post-harvest handling because there's been a lot of work on how we handle um, post-harvest. So it's very important to look at the harvest speed so that they're harvesting very rapidly, getting them in the plastic bags to slow down the water loss um, from just having them out in the air. Looking at um, the packaging, sometimes we'll just basically put them loose into a um, plastic bag. Sometimes we'll actually wrap them in paper into like a tamale wrap and the person purpose of that is basically to increase the amount of uh, moisture around those cuttings so that they don't dry out as much. Anyone that gets um, poinsettias, a lot of times you'll see that those are tamale wrapped, they're wrapped in moist paper to keep them. Remember to, that they have to be transported um, from the stock place into the holding area and we have to avoid high temperatures because with high temperatures we have high VPD. This chart that we're looking at basically shows the effect of temperature as recorded along the left-hand side of the graph um, versus different relative humidity, um, whether you're at 100% down to 35% relative humidity. And then what happens to the vapor pressure deficit? Remember the vapor pressure deficit as that number increases, the amount of water that's lost from the plant increases. So if at 90% relative humidity, which we all know is very high, and you basically raise the temperature from say 60 degrees up to 90 degrees, you can see that the vapor pressure deficit increases from about 1.8 up to 4.7. It almost increases a full threefold. So there's three times as much water. And as you can see, when we get down into relative humidities down around 60 
um, percent, that slight temperature increase can have a dramatic impact on the vapor pressure deficit of water loss from that cutting. So we really have to be very careful about the temperature transport. And that's something you need to be thinking about continuously through your entire process until you've got roots on that cutting so it can then take up water again. So this is one of the reasons why we talk about pre-cooling, getting that temperature down to reduce the vapor pressure deficit, um, regardless of what the humidity um, in that relative humidity is in that greenhouse. We also want to look at what is the intra versus the inter unrooted cutting temperature. The intra um, temperature is the temperature inside the cutting cutting itself. So you want to make sure what is the stem temperature, and you we're going to talk about how you measure that. Inter is the measurement between two cuttings. It's the air between it. And of course, that can fluctuate very rapidly and have no impact on the stem temperature. But we do want to make sure that we know what those temperatures are. We want to also know what is the holding conditions, because as we'll see in a moment, the refrigeration by nature is a de humidification, it reduces the humidity, and so therefore it creates a, an environment of very high vapor pressure deficit, which can dry out cuttings, and we'll see that in the grade. We'll also look at the shipping conditions, because one of the problems that we see consistently over time is, is that during transport, as they're going, coming from someplace in the central and southern hemisphere up into the northern hemisphere, they are exposed to high temperatures and there's these temperature bounces. If you get um, data loggers in your boxes, what you'll find is that there is in that box, um, if you see the temperature just nice and slowly increasing, that's okay. What really causes problem are these temperatures that go up and down over the course of the transport. Because as the temperature goes up, as you now know, the vapor pressure deficit increases and therefore the dehydration of that cutting will increase as more and more water is left. In fact, you can actually see it in the cuttings. If you open up your box and you look at the bag of cutting and you see water on the inside, you see droplets on the inside of that bag, what that's telling you is that that water in that bag came from the cutting. That cutting lost the water and it condensed on the plastic bag. So when you'll see the bag and they've got all kinds of droplets on the inside, that is a forewarning that you basically have had a temperature bounce somewhere along the line and therefore you've lost moisture. So it's very important to understand what is the moisture status because work that's been done um, many years ago in cut flowers by George Stabi and Tony Kofranik and a number of other um, researchers in cut flowers showed that this dehydration process is very detrimental to the long-term survival of cut flowers. And we now know it's even worse with unrooted cuttings. So now the thing that we have to be aware of is, and this is why I brought it up and spent a lot of time on this, is that there are a lot of these issues that the supplier is responsible for working on. And the suppliers have spent a lot of time, effort, and money in minimizing the um, loss of moisture of those cuttings. And that's the supplier. But you as a rooting station, you as a person who's rooting cuttings, do have a responsibility from the time they arrive on your dock. And this is where you can restore and rejuvenate cuttings. A lot of the research that uh, my team has done and now Nathan's team is working on has looked at how do we get the cuttings to be rehydrated. You know, are they cut flowers? Do they handle like cut flowers? Well, no, not really. It's very different. Um, but we do need to be aware of what we do in the receiving process. The moment they arrive, you are responsible for rehydrating those cuttings. The first thing, as we mentioned before, is check the temperature. What is the inter versus the intra? Remember, intra inter is between two cuttings where the intra is in the base of the cutting, the stem itself. What is those um, temperature? Because it's very important that you understand what the temperatures are, because that will dictate what are we going to do with those? What are the cooler conditions? Here we have an example of a dry cooler on the top. As you can see, remember I mentioned that refrigeration is a dehumidification. It dries the environment out. Um, you can see the squiggly blue line and then the um, squiggly green line on the top. That squiggly green line is the temperature oscillation as the unit 
basically cycles through cold um, cycles. And you can see the impact on humidity. So as the temperature goes up, the humidity comes down. As the temperature goes down, the humidity goes up. And it just basically, they go up and down like this. And as you can probably expect in that dry cooler where there's no humidity added, added to it, is that you have a very drying environment, a very high VPD that's drying those cuttings out, even though the temperatures are not you know, what you'd consider hot. Ideally, what you'd like is to is a cooler that has um, humidity in it, some vapor, it's a very high fog in it. And that's what the graph on the bottom where it shows the relative humidity in blue. Notice how it basically has very little bounce to it. It's fairly uniform. And notice that the temperature is also much more uniform um, and it doesn't oscillate as much. So when we look at an ideal chamber, the picture on the right is the ideal chamber, whereas the, the picture on the left is a chamber that is drying cuttings out. And of course, those cuttings are just sitting in a box and they're not getting out um, and getting taken care of. So we really want to be looking at that and determining how much time, because if we have them in a humidity environment, like on the right, they, the holding time is much longer. You can hold those in there. In fact, it's probably beneficial because they'll all rehydrate uniformly. Um, whereas the boxes on the left, those boxes need to be transplanted and, and stuck rapidly because they're just drying out and are basically slowly but surely starting to die. May, also, you need to be looking at what is your sticking area? What is the processing area? Is that a drying environment? Research of, that we've done has shown that if you take a fully hydrated cutting and just put it out into the great unwashed um, where there's no humidity control, it's basically a dry environment, within two to three hours, that cutting will drop down below 60% um, moisture content. And at that point, rooting is significantly delayed. So we want to really process and that's really the chain the cold chain the humidity chain that we want to be watching so really look at your sticking area in the staging area prior to mist so that when we start looking at it we're sure that we've got cuttings now how do you do this in your greenhouse how do you do this in your cooler there's two different re rehydration methods that we've seen are reasonably successful one is the dipping method where you basically um stick the cuttings and just stick them into a pail of water. Now that of course, any pathologist will tell you is just prone to spread diseases. So it is a, something you can do on plants that aren't disease, um, subject to disease issues. Um, but just getting the cutting wet, wet, wet will be better than doing nothing. A much superior method is to put those cuttings into some type of a fog chamber like you see in the bottom left hand corner. And that basically um, increases the contact with the free moisture so that you have maximum amount of um, humidity so that you basically are driving moisture into the cutting versus having it being sucked out which you have when you don't have the fog. And then of course, the whole question of, should we take the cuttings out of the bag or leave them in the bag? That's a decision that is operational. We do see it's always better, but is it significantly better? Um, depends upon if the cuttings are um, dehydrated. So if you basically got a bag that's got all kinds of droplets of water in it when you pick it up, obviously putting that bag um, taking the cuttings out of that bag into a humidity chamber is going to be far superior to just leaving them in the plastic bag. So you have to make some of these de business decisions as you go along. But when we take a look at, you know, what really happens, and I think this is a good example of after 24 hours in a, um, in a chamber, where the first one is where we have humidity added, so it's about 95% relative humidity, and they were in the bag, versus basically leaving it in the bag in just the cooler itself. And you saw the chamber where you basically had this oscillation of the humidity. As you can see, that cutting is starting to dry out. And we see this consistently. Conversely, on the two right-hand columns where you basically have got it in a humidity chamber and then you have no bag, um, that's where basically, if you can see, by exposing it, um, you can maximize the turgidity, the water absorption by that cutting. And that's where you have humid with no bag um, is 
far superior than leaving it in the cooler with no bag. So if you're going to take the cuttings out of the bag, they got to be in the humid, or else you're going to end up with this floppy dead bird versus the flying bird, which is the ideal cutting for um, maximum turgidity. And that's how you can train your workers to know, are they um, basically um, fully turgid, grab them by the stem, and if they're flying out there like a bird, you're good to go. If they're basically limp like that, well, you better do something because if you stick them, they're going to be a problem. What is the problem? And this is, I think, probably tells the story better than anything else. If we have a humidity chamber with bag, with no bag or with a bag is on the top of the graph, um, you, you can see this group of cuttings. Clearly, they're rooted. They're much more uniformly rooted. Nathan will talk about why some have more roots than others when he talks about um, photosynthesis. But when we take a look at um, putting them just in a cooler with no humidity and you have no bag and you have plus a bag, you can see that the rooting is much more variable and way more um, prone to no roots at all. So one of the clearly, if we have to go and lane um, identify what are the primary concerns. The primary concern is, is that cutting turgid? That's why we spend so much time really stressing this because 90% of your problems in the producing a, a uniform crop of liners, of rooted cuttings, is starts back in, did you address the turgidity of that cutting before you ever stuck it? If you didn't, you're going to be spending all your time trying to fix that failure to hydrate that cutting. If you hydrate the cutting, it's a much simpler and much more uniform process all the way to the end. And really be aware, is your sticking line basically drying your cuttings out? You know, this is an example, and we see many, many of these where they're basically, it's an open area with a lot of airflow and a lot of people, and there's literally just an open area where all of a sudden you basically can dry cuttings out. Notice the floor is dry. There's a lot of air movement, a lot of movement. Cuttings are sitting around for a period of time and they're all just sitting there drying out as they go. Much superior is a um, room where you have them in a fog. In fact, one of our um, rooting stations finds that if they leave the cuttings after stick in this fog area for um, overnight, prior to moving them into the greenhouse that they actually root more uniformly than if they stick and move them directly during the course of the day. And of course that is because they get a chance to rehydrate after the sticking process. So really keep in mind, hydration is the key to uniformity and success. So once we've got them stuck, then we have to look at how do we moisture, apply the moisture. Remember our diagram early on where we had the unrooted cutting on the left-hand side and we had the rooted cutting on the right-hand side. And so we're gonna start with high amounts of moisture and then we're gonna progressively decrease it as we start developing roots. So stage one is about getting that cutting turgid. So if we've made sure that they're hydrated, we put them in the greenhouse where we may have lower relative humidity, we need to make sure that during day zero to three on most of these herbaceous cuttings that we have a very high frequency of mist. Usually if we're using VPD, we're using it about every 0.5 um, and it accumulates the drying effect during the day and then triggers the, um, the mist to come on. And we want enough on cycle to basically keep the tray weight to a level four and, and in other um, presentations in Tech on Demand, we talk about the different water levels and using weight, water by weight, but it's really important that you don't saturate that soil because if you saturate that soil during this stage one, when you're trying to get the cuttings turgid, which a lot of growers do, they basically say, we're going to push water and we're going to try it and we're going to just pour water onto it during the first three days. And that's, that tray goes from, say, a thousand grams to five thousand grams it goes in five thousand that's all water so as you can see as you go through the process from the left to the rooted cutting on the right in our picture you need to reduce the water well if you got the things the soil saturated you're never going to get easily get that water out of there it's just too takes too much time so that you reduce rooting one grower that i worked with that just stopped saturating it at the the soil taking it up to 2,400 grams, 5,000 grams um, at the time of sticking, 
took almost two weeks of rooting time off their crop time just because they were able to dry the soil out as the roots started forming. Um, when once we have callus, then it's, and that's about day four to seven. And the calluses, you may or may not see it. It's a little bit of a swelling of the stem. It's a subrization of the base. You basically need to start, um, start drying them back slightly to start putting a little bit of stress, but you don't wanna wilt them. Callus does not involve wilting the plant. So make sure that you have adjusted your mist cycle. So you're not, you're putting on enough not to wilt, but I'm not, you're not saturating. When we get to stage three, this is when you actually have roots um, starting to form. If you pull that cutting out, you get this little root horn. It's this little nub on the side of the stem. And that's basically saying rooting is now in process. So we're now technically in stage three. And depending upon the different species that you're dealing with, it could be as early as day five and, or as late as day 10. But right in, um, that's your time frame that you really want to know that you now have root horns coming out. At that point, you need to start cutting the moisture back to start drying that soil off. Because as we know, fish grow in water and roots grow in air. Because what happens is, is that in the soil particles, the space between the particles is either filled with water or air. To get maximum root growth, what we have found over years is that you've got to have air in there. That gives you the most rapid rooting. It gives you branch roots, gives you basically that rapid rooted um, cutting. It basically, you can either... Um, start changing the, v, the VPD settings. So you start drying it out by increasing the VPD, which um, slows down how frequently it's on, or you can change the um, on cycle, how often it comes on if you're using a mechanical um, system to basically control how often. So when we take a look at VPD settings, there's different settings for different crops. So some um, crops are more dry requiring. So for example, lavender is a perfect example. Any of the high essential oils crops, what we see is, is that early on you wanna get them hydrated, but then you need to dry them out because continuing to put water on them tends to cause tip abortion and other delay in rooting. There's other crops, things like coleus or impatience, which basically you need, they're a little, um, you need to keep them a little moist, um, longer to make sure that they start, but once they start drying out, then you basically want to do a fast dry, like in the red line. And then of course, you want to start looking at others that are very slow rooting that you may need to have more low, um, more frequent VPD to keep them turgid, but then slowly they start coming on. So that there, you can either do it through the, changing your VPD settings, or if you have a mechanical trans um, controller, you can basically on different days control um, when you're missing, when is the on cycle? What should, should it be on or should it be off? And then how frequently, what is the frequency of that? And then also you can control the duration because remember the frequency plus the duration, the combination of the two, determines how much water is in the tray. So if you have a high, frequency, long duration, you're going to saturate that soil. If you have a short duration and a short frequency, um, basically you don't significantly increase the moisture content of the soil, which then allows you to dry it faster as you get into stage three. Because the biggest problem that we've seen over time is where growers are not drying them back um, fast enough once they get back to stage three, they're still keeping them at a saturated level or at a level four, and they're not taking them back down to a level three or level two to enhance root development throughout that root ball. Another side benefit that we see is when you have hydrated cuttings is that they stick faster. We've done studies with growers looking at um, hydrated versus dehydrated cuttings and looking at the sticking rate. And depending upon what the species is, you end up with anywhere between 10 to 20 percent faster sticking rate because it's just easier to stick a hydrated cutting versus if we take a look at the sticking on the um, left hand side notice how when you stick them you end up having to push and push and then not only that but they also tend to um, require you to put a dibble in and the problem with putting dibbles in is that what we see is is that you end up with a fairly large hole with a fairly small cutting and you end up without the soil back up against the root ball so there you end up with an air gap around the cutting and those cuttings 
cuttings don't, don't root. Why? It's because callusing and rooting is a wet, warm process. And so if you don't have soil up against it, then you're not going to get that cutting wet. It's going to have that air pocket, which will be very dry. So you really want to make sure that if you don't have to dibble, don't dibble. If you have hydrated cuttings, you get that real benefit. So we end up with a um, huge benefit from um, looking at it. So Nathan, why don't we talk a little bit about um, light? Because I think we've spent a lot of time talking about um, the effect of moisture, which of course I think is probably the most important. But then once we start getting rooting, now what do we do? I mean, rightly so, right? When we talk about people, we're mostly water and so are plants. And that's why we have to stress so much time on water and it affects all these other factors that we're now gonna talk about. So um, light obviously is important building block for photosynthesis. And we're detailing this section as daily light integral or DLI. And there's been a lot of work on light. Obviously plants have to have it. And DLI is really the accumulation of that light that plants are receiving over time. And so we're going to talk about how photosynthesis driver uh, produces carbohydrates, which are the building blocks and food for our plants. But also uh, a really big field right now is light quality and then photomorpho photomorphogenesis, which is really how we control the growth, the structure, the shape, the habit of plants using different colors of light in a sense. Uh, what are we seeing in this first picture here? Now, we saw in the beginning, but we didn't really detail a lot of that randomness that we're seeing. And hydration is really just a part of that story. Obviously, it's a very important part, but what we see on the stock plant level is, as Will said, overnight, cuttings and plants become very well hydrated. So in the morning, when cuttings are harvested, that cutting is going to be very turgid. But as we go throughout the day, those plants are accumulating light or DLI. And this, as we said, produces carbohydrates or food for the plant. So depending on when we harvest different species of plants, they may be more hydrated or have more carbohydrates. And it's not always the same of whether some plants um, always like to be harvested in the morning or be harvested in the afternoon. In this case, we looked at budlia or butterfly bush. And when we harvested those cuttings in the morning, we had this randomness, even though we had already addressed that rehydration issue, everything was all hydrated. We still got this random root growth some rooted very well, some did not. Now, when we harvested those cuttings in the afternoon, again, these cuttings were hydrated, we get a very uniform rooting and speedy rooting of those cuttings. So um, carbohydrates here are very important because we've loaded up those cuttings prior to their harvesting point. We've addressed the rehydration, so they have all of the food um, that's needed. So now let's look at the science behind this photo. Uh, now, Druge has done a lot of work with post-harvest handling, cuttings, and also root development. And let's dive into some of those carbohydrates, which is also what I worked on with my PhD uh, in cut flowers. So glucose, fructose, and sucrose, we know are common um, carbohydrates that are easily transported or broken down or used within the plant. Now, starch, is something that you may not often be talking about, but we all love them, right? They're in potatoes. They're also in other plant materials or organs. And those that starch is the storage area for energy. And so we have to look at all four of these within plants. On the left-hand side, we have the concentration of these carbohydrates, either in the leaves on the top or on the bottom in that stem base of the cuttings. Now, when we look at the leaves, you often think about, well, this is where I see nutrient deficiencies in rooting, but this is also the uh, source of the carbohydrates for the cutting once they're stuck. So all of the photosynthesis is occurring in the leaves, and that's going to go downwards towards the sink at the base of the cutting over time. Now, these cuttings have to be shipped for multiple days from likely offshore locations, and so they're going to have a period of time where they're going to be dark, they're going to be boxed, as Will said, 
we want to pre-cool them but in that dark period of time we're not photosynthesizing so we are potentially using up those carbohydrates during this time so in the leaf up on this top graph we have glucose fructose and sucrose and then in green is starch now over time looking at the dpe or days post excision so that's after harvest as we increase those days we really start to see a decrease in the amount of starch just after one day we've basically eliminated all the starch from these leaves and then if you go down and look at the stem base we're also decreasing that starch or storage reserves but that's not really happening uh, again until one to three days after um, harvest now the glucose fructose and sucrose are also getting used up in some capacity uh, but those are more mobile and starch can break down into those components. So when we think about storage or shipping, we really want to load up our cuttings and have high starch content because that is the storage or reserves for our cuttings. So now we're getting to the rooting process. And once we've got the cuttings, we've stuck the cuttings, uh, we've made sure that all our stock plants have the right amount of light and they have as much carbohydrate as possible once they get to the customer. Uh, now it's the customer's job or the rooting station's job to provide the right quantity or amount of light within the day to produce rooting as fast as possible and uniformly. So again, we're driving carbohydrate production by increasing the amount of light within a day that a cutting gets. Uh, Michigan State, as well as Purdue, has done a number of research projects on this. And as you can see on the right-hand side, when we increase the amount of light that cuttings are getting within a day, say from 1.3 all the way to uh, 10.8, we really get a lot more root production. And why? Well, we're producing more carbohydrates in our leaves, which are then getting transported down to the stem base to then increase rooting. However, you can't just jump the gun and give all the gas right away, right? Your tires are gonna spin. You're not gonna get enough traction to get these cuttings off. You're gonna cause some damage to them. So we have to think about this acclimation process. Uh, in that first figure you saw that Will went over is the light increases over the life of the cutting into producing a rooted liner. So, uh, plants do have a limitation to how much light they can use right away, and that is a saturation point, which really causes damage in the photosynthesis process or the system. And so right when we stick cuttings, you may want to look at, can I shade these cuttings, or what is the actual light intensity or PPFD within your greenhouse, and limit that and then increase it over time as that plant becomes more adjusted to its environment, as it grows more roots, it can then to use more light and produce more carbohydrates. How much light do you really need to provide though? Um, uh, Jim Faust at Clemson has really developed a lot of great DLI maps for uh, the United States. You can access that website down here on the bottom of the slide. But really when we're looking for high quality young plants or liners from vegetative cuttings, we're targeting a DLI of about six moles or more. Um, so you can look at and use this map uh, to determine what month you're in, how much light you're getting, and you'll want to reduce these numbers from about 25 to 50%, depending on your greenhouse structure and how much light you're getting into the greenhouse, and then put lighting in there and supplement to make sure you're at least getting six moles per day for uh, unrooted cutting production or for vegetative liner production. I also put in here increasing your intensity over time. Again, this is PPFD or micromoles per meter squared per second. Uh, get yourself a light meter. It's gonna be a great investment for your operation and knowing how much light is coming in there and how to manage that light. And then again, light is not a factor on its own. It's interacting with temperature and nutrition. We've already talked about hydration and making sure we're set there. But as we increase light, we need to make sure that we're at the right temperature, as well as providing the resources for the plants to produce those carbohydrates with the amount of light we're providing. 
This gets us into the probably the most exciting part about light, and you'll see a lot of work going on in LEDs right now, even in the home sector, right? Uh, we're trend, we're out of incandescence, and now we're getting to LED lights everywhere. Uh, this has a lot to do with energy efficiency, but there are these factors or X factors that we can use lights for um, controlling photomorphogenesis. And again, that's controlling height, controlling leaf structure, um, branching, all of these components that really set plant quality apart from the next person. So here I've got pictured a bunch of different uh, spectrums or wavelengths of light that uh, we can look at. On the left-hand side, this is ambient light or natural sunlight that uh, in a greenhouse, say in Illinois, you're not providing any extra light. This is what your plants receiving over time. And generally we're looking at around 400 to 700 nanometers, um, which is anywhere from that blue or dark purple spectrum all the way into the red spectrum or color. And when we produce plants under this ambient or natural sunlight with a low amount of DLI, so again, that's not very much light that they're accumulating in a day, we tend to get a stretchy plant that's still rooted, but it's not the best thing we really want for someone we're selling these liners to. All the way on the right-hand side is the high pressure sodium lamp. Now this is the tried and true light that's been used for quite a while within the greenhouse industry. And as you can see that the, the spectrum is quite different from natural light. We've got a lot of red, a lot of yellow, a little bit of blue, a little bit of green, and then there's that far red black bump all the way on the right hand side. And with this, we can produce a higher quality plant that's slightly shorter, more well branched, and is actually flowering in comparison to the ambient light. And that's because we've supplemented the amount of light. Then we have in the middle, and these are plants produced under uh, light emitting diode fixtures or LEDs. And I've got the uh, DRWLB, and that stands for a deep red, white, low blue fixture, or MB, which is a medium blue fixture. And there you can see that these lights are very specific in their wavelength. We've got a section of blue, we've got a section of green, lots of red, and a little bit of uh, dark here in the bottom. And really what this is saying is that we've targeted that low blue, which you can see is higher in the medium blue. We've got green to make it look more white. And then that deep red is here, which is the biggest portion and uh, very well used for photosynthesis in the plant. Now, what I want you to see through this picture are these dotted lines and really looking at the difference in the height of these liners. And so with the LEDs, we're able to produce a slightly shorter, more compact liner that still has the same number of leaves, but this really reduces uh, what we're gonna talk about in the next slide is the potential um, use of plant growth regulators to keep plants more compact. So as this video shows up, you'll see this floppy plug on the left-hand side and a very well um, compact shorter leaves, um, more green plant on the right-hand side. And it was flopping around on the left-hand one. And so really what our growers want to produce at the end of the day is a liner that's um, more compact and resilient to shipping, uh, to transplanting for automation in the future, um, and something that looks really aesthetically pleasing and healthy to the customer going out the door. So with this uh, photomorphogenesis control with different spectrums, we really have the ability to move to a more sustainable production system, which is a key component of Ball, the co our company moving forward, as well as lots of other industries. How do we produce our products more sustainably? And one way is to reduce the number of chemicals we're putting out into the environment. So with these lights, you'll see on the right-hand side, are these different petioles of petunia. Now these top two were produced under high pressure sodium uh, with or without PGRs. And then these bottom four were produced with LEDs with or without PGR. And of course, in the top, you see this really large um, paler green leaf from the petunia. And then when you use PGRs, you do get a little bit uh, shorter leaf, right? Great. 
um, but it's not quite what we're looking for because we're still getting that floppy plug here we saw in the video. With LEDs, we've basically reduced the length of that leaf by in half, as well as you can see a darker color. Um, so when you add PGRs under the yellow, we do still get a little bit reduction. So there's an option there for growers to use. But really, this is showing us that we have the opportunity to produce these plants without plant growth regulators. Basically, we're eliminating a chemical application. So we're saving labor. Uh, we're improving our environment for our workers as well as uh, nature. When we um, move on to um, the whole issue of degree days, we, I mentioned this earlier. This is degree days is a measurement of how much temperature above a base temperature. This base temperature is where plants just don't grow because um, it's just too cold. You know, so as you increase the temperature um, through, um, you basically, what you do is you increase respiration. Respiration gives you more growth so that the higher the average daily, the more degree hours, the more degree days you have, the faster they grow. This is a very common um, tool that's used in the fruit and vegetable industry as they measure maturity of a plant is how many degree days does it take from the time you plant it until it's ready to harvest. So we have this concept of, you know, the higher the temperatures, the, um, the faster the plants grow, which of course, once you've got roots and you're basically, um, their plants are transplanted, this can be a good thing. But of course, back when we're looking at unrooted cuttings, this can be a very bad thing because you don't want the respiration too fast because the plants really are not um, basically photosynthesizing as rapidly as they could be and they can't take up water. So there's water deficiency. So you have a lot of different problems. So some of the early work that we did um, by one of our colleagues um, she did an extensive amount of work looking at the respiration rate and the temperatures at which we get down to the low, zero respiration point where the plants basically go into almost a stasis where if they do photosynthesize, the carbohydrates will increase because they're not being um, utilized through respiration. But if you, and of course, then also she looked at, at what higher temperature is respiration increased, which of course causes that depletion that the Nathan showed you on that scientific work that shows that, you know, that over time you deplete the carbohydrates, but if you add higher temperatures, it goes even faster. So what she did is she looked at a number of different species because um, we were looking at, could we do modified atmosphere packaging, which is a whole technology that's used in lettuce. It's used in a number of vegetables to enhance post-harvest and maintain um, plant quality during the shipping process. Well, one of the first things that we found was is that all of the different species and even the different varieties, because we looked at it at the variety level, what we found was is that they had very different respiration rates, which basically make mo modified atmosphere packaging just impossible to implement. But from that research, what we found was a very interesting set of um, results, which basically showed us that crops like Lantana, the, um, the blue um, line, and you look at how much is the respiration rate and how they measure it is that they measure about how much CO2, which is a measurement of respiration, is produced per kilogram per hour of plant tissue. So they say this cutting, how much CO2, or what is the respiration of this cutting at different temperatures? So they looked at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and 35 degrees centigrade, which of course we know is 40, 50, 60, 70, 80-ish, and then it just gets hot. Um, so, and that looks at four hours of dark storage and then what happens. And what we see is if you look at the blue line, which I mentioned is Lantana, is that it basically, even at five degrees, at very low temperatures, um, at 40 degrees, <clears throat> it still is respiring. It respires, and if um, one of the cutting that we have trouble with, with early morning um, harvesting um, is of course Lantana, just like the um, Budlia that um, Nathan had mentioned. So, and then you have other crops like um, Impatience or um, 
the uh, geraniums, which basically respiration rates are very, very low um, at the 40 degree temperatures and basically go up fairly slowly and except for geraniums, which then go up fairly rapidly once you get to 20 to plus 20 to 30 degrees. Um, centigrade. So you can see that there's all kinds of different variability here, which basically helped us understand that there are different crops that some that basically um, have a rapid rise, which we need to cool them down very rapidly. So to maintain carbohydrates, and then there's others that have a very slow um, increase in those we basically can um, store at lower temperatures and that we're not as concerned with how rapidly we cool them down. So this has been a very important piece of information as we look at not only the post-harvest handling of them, but also it's a clue as to what we should do as we move, as we start sticking cuttings and we hold cuttings. Now, what has it done to the post-harvest? And I think this is important that people understand this is where we've made a lot of investments is that we've looked at the harvest transport. And this is, of course, research also that was done early in the cut flower work by Stravi and others, which so showed that rapid movement from um, to pre-cooling is very important. What we have here is an old um, vehicle type vehicle that was used to collect cuttings in the greenhouse and take them back to the packing shed where they're basically put into inventory. And what we have here is, is a infrared photograph of that um, unit of that box that out in the greenhouse in the afternoon. And as you can see down on the bottom of the cutting of the box, where it's blue, it's down around 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas up on the top, you basically are up to 100 degrees or more. And as we all know is, is that when it's cool, you don't um, sweat as much. But when it's warm and very hot, you sweat a lot because your body is trying to cool itself. And of course, cuttings are no different. They'll do exactly the same thing. So what happens is that these were little easy bake ovens of sorts, where they basically, you put the cuttings in it, if they took too much time to get to the packing shed, then basically you could dehydrate them in transit. Of course, this completely changed the handling and time of handling of the cuttings from the harvest to the packing shed. Then when we started looking at what does a modern packing shed look like today, and of course a modern packing shed basically brings the cuttings in and then puts them through a pre-cooling tunnel which rapidly drops the inter and intra, more importantly the intra temperature down and they're checking the stems to make sure that the temperatures are down and that the humidity is up so that they just don't desiccate those cuttings by running them under very cool temperatures, but they run them through it and then put them into a, um, a holding area where they basically will have cool crops that they're maintaining around 38 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit and then the um, warm crops, which they're at 50, 55 degrees, like poinsettias do not do well in a cool um, chamber, but they will store very well in a warm um, chamber. And then of course the relative humidity is high so that they're not drying these cuttings out, very important. And then of course, once they get into shipping, it's really important to have full boxes. This is why when you order cuttings, they're always trying to fill the box up because a tightly packed box stays colder longer. And it's, um, if you've got a box that's got a lot of air in it because the box is in full, that basically that air can change temperature very rapidly, which then impacts the bag. And as we talked about earlier, once the bag warms up, then the cuttings start to transpire and the water starts leaving the cuttings and collects on the surface of the bag. So we really wanna have a tightly packed box. And of course the box is normally insulated to prevent both heat and cold depending upon the time of the year, from infiltrating the inside of the box. And then under warm conditions, they'll tend to put an ice pack in the middle of the box. And what that does is it tends to keep the temperature more modulated. It does not reduce the temperature. It just slows down any increase in temperature. So if you put warm cuttings into a box, guess what they are when you basically take them out? They're warmer. If you take cold cuttings and put them in a box, whether you've got ice in there or not, they tend to be cold when you take them out. 
It's also important that they thoroughly seal the box. This is one of the early works that George Stabby found was is that if you basically seal the box by taping the box, it's very important. I know when you receive your box, you go, why do they have so much tape on this box? Well, it's to seal it. It's no different than if you've got an air conditioned house and a window open, guess what happens? That room will warm up because of infiltration of air and all of the places where the box isn't sealed tight warm air in transit can enter in and basically impact the cuttings. So now let's talk about handling prior to sticking. So now you've gotten your cuttings, they've come shown up in the box. One of the first things you wanna do is to check that box. You wanna check that bag to see, do we have water on the inside of the bag? That's a flag that says, aha, we've got an issue we need to address. You wanna check the intra stem temperature. Do not go and measure the bag because that's just measuring the plastic temperature, an irrelevant piece of information. Open the bag, point in there, notice a little red dot in there measuring the stick, the cutting itself to see what are the stem temperatures. Making sure that you've got them down to temperature, get them down to temperature as rapidly as possible. Get them, um, because we know that without a temperature bounce where the temperature travels, they, they don't have moisture in the bag, they basically, stem temperatures are cold upon arrival. Those can stem store longer. But if you've got cuttings that have bounced during transit and water on the bag, those need to be immediately stuck as rapidly as possible or put into a cold, very humid um, green um, storage area to basically rehydrate them. Remember that 100% hydration, even um, when you um, look at the degree days, because if you, even at warmer temperatures, if you have a very humid um, environment, you basically continue to rehydrate them even at warmer temperatures. So if you don't have a 40 or 45 degree um, chamber, but you've got to have a use a 60 degree, it's better 60 with humidity is infinitely going to be better. In fact, it's going to be way better than if you basically had 40 with none. So make sure that you've got the um, to use humidity as a way to compensate for your inability to have cool temperatures. Airflow um, should be minimized. This should have dead air because a lot of airflow basically helps dry cuttings out um, because that basically changes the inter the temperature between the cuttings um, and you wanna really minimize that. So let's talk about rooting temperature because that's really important because you wanna be accumulating temperature to basically now get the process going because roots, development is a respiration process. Growth is a respiration. You know, just as when, when you have a little baby, um, like Nathan, and I'm sure he can uh, attest to this, is that when his son basically starts eating a couple of days later, he grows. And we've seen this with the teenager that you send up one night and they come back as a little monster, you know, have looks like they've grown two feet because they basically, but before that they eat and eat and eat in anticipation of growing. So we basically, we want to make sure that they've got the carbohydrates and then we want to get them into the right temperatures to get them to grow um, very effectively. And of course, what do we want to grow when we're rooting cuttings? The step one is we want roots. Without roots, we have nothing. So we need to get those roots. And so we really want to get um, root. And remember I mentioned earlier about callus proliferation is a warm, wet, process. So we want to get the callus, um, which is in the soil, warm to basically promote very rapid root development. Because if you think about what callus does, is callus basically breaks apart the pith. The pith is that area between the outside epidermis and basically the vascular bundle. That's the tissue between there. And basically the um, it basically softens that up so that the root that's coming off the, um, the uh, vascular bundle can easily pass through the pith and get to the outer epidermis and then pass through the outer epidermis. You want to soften that tissue up so that the roots can come out rapidly. So one of the things that has been done very nicely recently was some research on GARA, which is somewhat of a difficult plant to root at times. And they looked at the temperature and light intention, intensity, the moles per day. So under very low light intensity, um, rooting of course is consistently very bad. As you increase the light intensity, which is the next um, line 
<clears throat> coming from the bottom over time, you can see that you get better rooting when the temperatures are warmer. And of course, then if you start getting even higher light conditions, then you can have even more up to a point where you have too, it can be too warm, just like too much light, too warm is also. So as a rule of thumb, um, somewhere around 24 degrees, which is around 75 degree Fahrenheit is really the ideal temperature for that root. And so using your infrared thermometer to check your soil temperature, using soil probes, whatever you're using, use it. And especially during the winter, because one of the things you have to remember is that at night, the soil temperature, when you're putting heat into the greenhouse from below, it's basically it's evaporating water and evaporating water cools the soil. So it's not uncommon to drop the soil temperature by four or five degrees um, when during the night, just because of evaporative cooling. So then we wanna look at what is the air temperature for stage one and two, where you really don't want any top growth. You want it all down below in the roots. That's when you get callus and you get root initials starting. Um, that's where you want the so air temperature to be very cool. Once we get to stage three, when we're wanting to start it to grow, one of the things that you can do is using diff. Diff is the day minus the night temperature work that was done at Michigan State many years ago that basically showed that if you have a zero or negative day minus night, so you have a 60 degree day and a 65 degree night, day 60 minus 65 night gives you a negative five degree diff. A negative five degree diff will keep the plants more compact than the reverse where you had a 65 degree day and a 60 degree night, which is 65 minus 60 is a plus five, those plants will grow. So usually about 10 degrees. So if you got 70 and 60, that's going to be a problem. If it's 80 and 60, that's a bigger problem. You get more and more stretch. And even with um, the use of LEDs, it makes the use of LEDs makes it less stretchy, but they still stretch because diff is a very powerful phenomena. But also be aware of the average daily temperature. This is that whole degree day. We have to accumulate a certain amount of heat units over time to maximize growth or they're too slow. That's why we're normally looking at 68, 75 degrees average daily temperature. So you take the day plus the might, night average together, that gives you the average. That basically gives you a maximum growth rate. So we're really looking at this, what is the air temperature once we've got roots underneath us? So let's take a look at um, what is the um, basic nutrient level. One of the challenges that we have with unrooted cuttings is the cycle time, the time from harvest to harvest um, is very short. It's usually depending upon crop four to six weeks, which for some crops, they just can't take up all of the macro and micronutrients sufficient to basically get the ideal plant growth. Nitrogen is rapidly taken up by the plant. Nitrogen is seldom ever seen as a problem. It's seldom below 3% which is where you start seeing nitrogen deficiency. But phosphorus is restricted in the fertilization programs because we know that research that's been done shows that excessive phosphorus plus ammonia will tend to cause the plants to stretch. And so that it's the combination of the two that gives you the stretch. And so what grow, the stock plant growers will do is they'll restrict phosphorus to the bare minimum to basically keep the plants from being too stretched and not giving you a short compact cutting. So um, once you stick that cutting, if you don't add phosphorus, of course, what you immediately start seeing is you see this purpling, um, very pre prevalent in certain crops of verbena. Usually I look at it as the petunias, calipricoa, verbena. If you see purple, you got phosphorus across your entire crop. But also this nitrogen and phosphorus can be um, a problem because as soon as the plant starts growing, nitrogen is moved from the old foliage where it was accumulated into the developing new foliage. And that translocation then gives you lower leaves that are yellow. And of course, then if you're low in phosphorus, you start getting this purple redding and you start ending up with um, plants that are significantly reduced in vigor. Also, um, depending upon the conditions that they're grown under, you could have calcium and boron. Certain crops have boron. Normal, notice the abnormal growing points on these impatiens. That's classic calcium boron 
um, uptake. And there's a lot of times it has to do with either poor transpiration, it's too humid in your um, rooting area. Remember, you need to basically be drying this out. It should not be a swamp once you start rooting. You need to have it fresh. If you can walk in there and you can feel the humidity, it's too humid. You shouldn't be able to chew the air from the humidity. It should be a nice, fresh environment. One of the sleepers is that people miss get this confused because they see the plants turning yellow like we see down here, and they basically immediately assume that it is iron deficiency. Iron generally is not a deficient nutrient in most unrooted cuttings. Manganese, MN, not magnesium, MG, but manganese, MN is a micronutrient, is basically the nutrient that goes deficient and causes the plant to turn yellow. Now, of course, Nathan would spend hours telling you why this is, because basically when you look at the photosynth photosynthetic machinery, one there's two parts of it. One part uses iron, the other part uses manganese, MN. Well, iron is used to convert, um, you know, basically CO2 to water and carbohydrates. Awesome. But the energy to basically drive the process, ATP, NADP, that, those are the energy drivers. Those are sitting over on the other side of the, of the process, which is basically uses manganese. So if you're deficient in manganese, you, you're iron poor, you're basically not iron, you're manganese poor plant is basically hmm, kind of sleepy. In fact, that's one of the things that we immediately see is if you get the manganese um, at the right level, the cuttings produce more rapidly, they grow more vigorously, more uniformly, and it's just because of manganese. And in fact, if you've been ironizing your crops by just putting iron on and they basically turn green and then two days, three days later, they turn yellow and they turn green, turn yellow, you've got a manganese deficiency because when you put manganese on, it basically is there. Now, why is there manganese deficiency? Well, manganese uptake by the plant is occurs at um, pH is not six. And of course, the pH that we try to grow most of our crops is right around six. So at the pH we grow our crops at, plants don't take up manganese very efficiently. So consequently, we tend to be drawing very low. And I stress this a lot because this is probably the one that confuses a lot of growers. So really be aware of manganese. So once, and those are basically, that's what's coming to you. So you need to make sure that you're adding um, the right amount of nutrients afterwards and also making sure that you get the soil dried out because you get this confounding factor of wet soils reduces nutrient availability or uptake either because you're putting clear water on leaching them all out or you're basically saturating the soil and there's not the root development because as we know fish grow on water roots grow on air and the roots need to have that fuzzy little tips to increase the root um, nutrient uptake so remember, keep it, make sure that you've got adequate manganese um, and not just iron and that you add phosphorus. Phosphorus is very important. Not a lot, but you need to make sure that you've got phosphorus. Don't be using 15015 because that zero basically means there's no phosphorus. You need to use 201020 or another one of the phosphorus containing fertilizers to make sure that you've got sufficient phosphorus. If you do see boron or you've got environment where you boron is a problem, make sure that you add additional boron. So, um, so Nathan, why don't you talk about some of the research that you've done of the interaction between nutrition and um, using LED lights? Because this is probably the oops that most people miss. Yeah, I mean, when as more and more people adopt LEDs, there is a difference between high pressure sodium and LEDs, and it has to do with that infrared heat that comes off of that high pressure sodium. It heats up that leaf surface and drives transpiration, which drives nutrient uptake. So usually when you switch to LEDs, you need to increase your greenhouse temperatures by two to three degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and that doesn't always happen. And as Will indicated, some of these uh, cuttings may come in deficient of certain nutrients. Um, and one thing we hear a lot with LEDs is my plants are turning purple. And uh, there's literature out there looking at anthocyanins. Uh, some people say it's phosphorus. Um, we are doing research to determine what that really is. 
but it likely is a combination of both. LEDs do tend to cause a production of anthocyanins or that blue coloration. Blueberries have a lot of anthocyanins um, or purple coloration. And so that is a part of it, but it also could be partly in because of the phosphorus uptake, whether it's because of the plant or because of the uh, difference in temperature in the root zone and their ability to uptake phosphorus. So here we have um, petunias that were produced under LEDs. And this is about two weeks after sowing. We're either talking about plugs right now or from seed, but the same thing applies to our cuttings. Um, early on in that process, we talked about acclimation of light. If you're pounding them with light, driving photosynthesis, but you don't have the nutrients there to take it up, you're going to be deficient. So these uh, plugs here are showing some phosphorus deficiency under the low blue and medium blue LEDs seen here circled in purple. In comparison, the high pressure sodium is just above that threshold um, of being non-deficient in phosphorus. And so those ones are green. However, um, as we go along, we get more root development. Here we can see the comparison between high pressure sodium and our LEDs on the right. Um, so as those plants developed more roots, the substrate was able to dry down. We were providing the adequate nutrients. We were able to overcome that deficiency and produce a actually darker green plant that does not look deficient and is more compact. And you can see here in the tissue analysis that we now are above that about 0.49 deficiency mark for phosphorus and petunia we're above that level now. And so uh, phosphorus, and again, also has an effect of limiting stretch and growth. So uh, we're it's able to produce that more compact plant. But again, generally when you add light, you have to have adequate building blocks there like nutrients in order to produce that high quality plant. So um, I think we've covered four of the plant growth factors now. Uh, what are we missing, Will? Well, one of the um, big issues that really has very little research done on it um, is the whole issue of gas exchange, specifically CO2 within a canopy. Um, since for cost purposes, we're basically growing stock plants at a very high density. We're growing our cuttings at a very high density. So there's a very large number of plants very close to each other. And as you can see, um, both on the picture on the top, that's the, what the stock plants would look like. And if you take a look at um, some cuttings on the bottom, you can see that there is not a lot of ways when you get a whole bench of these plants that you can get good air exchange down into the canopy down below the top of the plants so that you basically have very limited um, CO2 within the plant. So CO2 can become a very limiting factor. Now, of course, if you're trying to make carbohydrates, which require carbon, and you're not putting in any carbon, you obviously are going to have less, you know, less carbon in gives you less carbon out. So basically, it's important that we start looking um, in the future, when as we add We've got fully hydrated cuttings. We put lots of light on them. We've got the right temperature. We've got everything basically ready to go. We are, you know, we're sitting in our driveway with our car, but someone forgot to put gas in it. And of course, CO2 is the gas that drives this whole process. So we need really need to start thinking about how are we going to get gas in there. Now, one of the things that you can do if you don't want to inject CO2 is by getting some air exchange. Um, so that you could basically get a little bit of turbulence. So using, instead of horizontal airflow, we use vertical airflow, which basically causes stirring of the canopy so that the leaves literally flitter a little bit. If the leaves flitter a little bit, you basically you're driving some air and CO2 in there and you can get some um, higher CO2 in, the, in, the, in there. So it's one of the areas for future research um, it's an exciting area, I think, especially for um, cutting production um, and something that we'll look forward to Nathan probably getting into at some time in the future. Yeah, so that closes out those limiting factors, but I don't think we've really addressed uh, rooting hormones, which is an important aspect of rooting stations and their processes. So where should we go with rooting hormones, Will? Well, um, the rooting hormones basically are crutch. 
Um, if you don't have those five factors for whatever reason, sometimes you can't rehydrate, sometimes you don't have the light, sometimes you don't have the temperature, sometimes you can't manage the moisture after um, propagation because you're trying to root, you know, 40 different species on the same bench. So it's really in, virtually impossible. So, you know, there's a lot of operational issues um, in, in where you can't optimize the conditions for your plant material. So in that case, what growers I think have found was is that um, rooting hormones, specific ones, and I think Nathan, you've done a lot of research on this, really make a difference um, from a more uniform rooting. But if you have the ability to manage the environment, those five factors really precisely, or at least reasonably precisely, growers find that rooting hormones are just one more thing that doesn't make a difference. But why don't you talk a little bit about your research that you've done and others have done? Right. Yeah. Well, let's there's three types of rooting hormones. And when we're talking about this hormone, it's actually auxin, uh, which drives, drives the root development process. And there's three ones that could be used within our industry right now. Uh, one is NAA. And NAA is generally used for more woody plant material, um, but this is non-soluble in water. So uh, there's some limitations to its uses uh, and the ease of use. Then we have indole acetic acid, which is IAA. Uh, this is also non-soluble and it actually breaks down in light. So again, there's a really limiting uh, opportunity to use this rooting hormone, which is why a lot of people have moved to uh, IBA or indole butric acid. Uh, this again is still non-soluble in water. So what uh, uh, producers have done is made a powder form of this. Now you can get this off the shelf as a homeowner or uh, as at the professional level, but basically there's different percentages of IBA in this powder that you can dip the cuttings into and then stick them in your trays. However, powder forms are an opportunity to transmit diseases, but it's also super labor intensive. You have to touch every single cutting into the powder and then into a tray. So uh, one exciting thing that has gained a lot of use within uh, North America and in America is the liquid IBA forms. And this is a soluble form that has uh, basically a potassium salt that makes it soluble in water. So we can get a concentrate, mix it with water to a certain concentration, and then apply a certain volume over a wide crop. Uh, or large number of cuttings. So uh, it's really reducing our opportunity for diseases by getting each cutting into the same powder, but it also is increasing our labor efficiency. But what's really important, important here is what concentration are we using as well as the volume? And that's where we've been spending some time in researching of is how to make sure that how much we apply is getting to the active point of root development, right? We want all of that volume to get down to the stem base. And that's generally where you up the volume or double the volume. So you're applying the same amount of rate, but it's all dripping down to the stem base of the cutting. But also we're looking at all of these new products that we're launching, which ones are most effective with rooting hormones, which ones could we get a detrimental effect? And that's really feeding um, this culture research side of our business and making sure that our customers have the right information when they receive new products from us. So as you go forward into your vegetative propagation realms or worlds, or if you wanna get in this career, um, we hope that this uh, presentation has really laid out these five different factors for you and how they might be limiting your success in propagation. So again, we've got acronyms for this. So the first one being related to water, TMC, total moisture control. We want to rehydrate cuttings and dry down so that we grow roots in air. But we also want to supply the right amount of light to produce carbohydrates but also take the opportunity to modify that plant habit so you get the best quality plant. Uh, in the middle is our temperature. We wanna reduce our respiration in the post-harvest phases prior to sticking, but then also use temperature to control our growth rate. Um, then of course, nutrition. We are always applying fertilizers to our plants and we need to make sure that we're providing the correct nutrient 
to uh, get the amount of growth we want, but also uh, address the deficiencies that those plants may have, depending on the environment they're in. And finally, uh, the research researchable area coming up in the near future is gas exchange. How do we make sure that we uh, avoid a boundary layer and make sure we're getting CO2 to the plant so that when we're pushing them to use more light at a higher temperature with more nutrients, they have the amount of CO2 they need to grow and be successful. Wow, guys, that was a lot of information. I really want to thank uh, both you guys for taking the time to go through this. You covered all sorts of the key critical processes involved in the production of healthy and viable uh, liners and uh, really took a, a deep dive into a lot of the, the challenges and pinch points that, that might come up throughout this entire process through all the different stages of production. I think that if any greenhouse that's producing large numbers really needs to take a hard look at these processes and probably work through all the different uh, stages and, and the, the pieces of information shared by, by our presenters today. So thank you guys very much. Is there anything we missed or anything you want to say as, as we wrap this up today? Well, we, well, I, I, you know, as, as the old guy first, um, the, uh, you know, the, the challenge of, of spending 30 years working on these is that you just know too much. And so um, hopefully this isn't, doesn't seem overwhelming because it's really not that complicated. If you are rooting a billion cuttings a year, it can't be that complicated. What we've tried to do here I, in, is provide some of our back insight and experiences um, of where things go wrong. So this might be one of those um, um, webinars, Bill, that you may want to um, listen to, just kind of remember what's going on. But then all of a sudden, when you when you run into a problem, you go back and go, hmm, I think they talked about something like this. And then go back and listen to specifically the problem and see, yeah, maybe that's that. And then this is how you could fix it. So hopefully this is kind of a guide, gives you that hierarchy of how things kind of fit together. Um, and hopefully um, they can learn and, and experience and, and be more successful going forward. Yeah, I think as, as more people get in the industry or younger people are entering the industry, we really need to go back and what is the found, what are the foundations of plant growth, right? We can get lucky in a sense uh, every year that, oh, this worked, oh, this worked. And then a problem comes up and you're like, well, I did everything the same as last time. But going back to those foundations, like was the light actually the same? Was the temperature actually the same? Or maybe it's just the cuttings were a little bit different. And so really having this foundation that you can go back on and really help you work through a process or a problem is gonna be really helpful. And I think speaking of the of those foundations, as well as the uh, timely and and uh, immediately relevant content, is uh, all of the resources that we have created with uh, Tech on Demand. It truly is a multimedia package. We have some of the QR codes up here on the screen. Everything from a weekly newsletter where we address the the issue of the week, um, things that have come up uh, and and been presented to our team, challenges from from greenhouse uh, professionals all across North America and really around the world uh, that we try to address in a in a weekly timely fashion, as well as a podcast where we dig deeper into issues, much like we've done today, um, in an in an audio format. So if you uh, if you're in the greenhouse or uh, or driving around and, and you want to take a listen to the podcast, we definitely uh, would recommend that. We have tons of videos on YouTube, and I'll put all the, these links uh, in the show notes or in the video description uh, for you to quickly access uh, if you can't snap the QR codes while you're watching right now. Uh, the Ball Red Book has been an industry uh, sort of uh, textbook for for decades and uh, it continues to be updated. We're on version number 19 and uh, includes all the, uh, a lot of information on specific crops as well as greenhouse technology. And last but not least, I would encourage anybody watching this video to join the Greenhouse Tech Team Facebook group. Quickest way to find that is to go into Facebook and search Greenhouse Tech Team as a group. 
Uh, it is a closed group, so you do have to answer a couple questions to prove that you're a professional and not a hobbyist. And I will uh, let you write in as the moderator. I, I keep an eye on that every day and we'll let you write in and you'll find a ton of resources there as well as the opportunity to interact in a peer-to-peer -peer environment all based around topics like we discussed today. So again, Ball Tech On Demand is a full multimedia slate of resources that we continue to add to constantly with experts like Nathan and Will. So you guys, thank you so much for all of your time and, uh, and, and sharing your experience and a lot of the research that's been done. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. And I'm Bill Calkins with Tech On Demand, wishing you all the best. <laughs>